This video is sponsored by Curiosity Stream. Why waggle my sixth finger and call me Ishmael? Looks like terrible writing advice is finally covering revenge plots. Revenge plots are not only filled with marvelous storytelling potential, but also sound really cool when added to a story's title. Worry not about an intricate revenge plot coming apart at the seams when you have me to help any aspiring writer craft their very own elaborate vendetta. For their story, of course, because it's not like this video is part of any of my ulterior motives. No, definitely not. So let's ignore those previous two lines and set sail to slay our very own white whale of a revenge plot. Now, the first step in constructing a revenge plot is by motivating a character to seek revenge. You see, revenge is a dish best served with the generous helping of emotional context. But that doesn't mean that said emotional context can't be as stupid and contrived as possible. The general rule of thumb is that the good guy's moral behavior is usually rewarded with their family murdered, home destroyed, town burned to ash, and entire lives shattered at the hands of the antagonist, giving them a very dramatic revenge motive. If a bad guy wants a revenge plot, then they have to settle for getting snubbed at a rewards ceremony, having their food order mixed up, or some other minor inconvenience that makes their revenge unsympathetic. We can't risk giving the villain something like an understandable motive. Better focus on how to make the protagonist's revenge motive fit within the themes and tone of the story. But that's like really hard? So instead, let's take these easy shortcuts. The fastest way to establish a revenge motive is to make the antagonist take or destroy something of the protagonist. But what could that be? I have two birds I need to kill but only one stone. And I also have this annoying love interest character lying around that I'm not really interested in developing. Oh hey! Into the refrigerator you go, love interest. Now I don't have to worry about that silly romance side plot, and I have a really good reason for the protagonist to seek revenge. Now, some may wonder if violence inflicted upon women solely to establish a male character's motive might be considered both dated and in poor taste. But the real question is how can we make this even better? By completely indulging in non-family friendly, ad demonetizing grimdark violence that completely clashes with the story's tone. This is also a great time to slip in some of a writer's less savory taste by fetishizing the violence for that extra bit of shock value. Be sure to put this in the prologue or chapter one, even though the rest of the story is a lighthearted action adventure, appropriate for all ages. You know, I mean, after the detailed <laughs> scene that is. Got to weed out the casuals after all. No need to worry about the scene coming across as indulgent rather than tragic, even if the greatest tragedy involved is that the writer's thinly veiled indulgence made it past the editing process somehow. The thing about revenge motives is that the writer doesn't need to worry about the audience's unintentional apathy towards the protagonist's status as victim. If the story tells the audience that the protagonist is wronged, then they will just be totally on board no matter how little characterization the protagonist and his murdered love interest get. No doubt they will be just as upset that the protagonist's blandest beige fiancé, Tragica Daisun, bites it in the prologue with her grand total of zero dialogue lines. The audience doesn't need to be invested in the characters to also be invested in the revenge plot because it's not like a revenge plot is character driven or anything. The only thing a writer need worry about is accidentally giving the revenge motive depth by exploring survivor's guilt or by giving the villain a legit reason to wrong the protagonist in the first place. That's bad because it might lead to characterization and engaging conflict as opposed to the blind one-sided power fantasy edge fest I was going for. Now, if all this character motive stuff sounds too hard, then it can be safely ignored. This character is out for revenge. Because having the fantasy party's resident anti-hero say revenge all the time is just so cool. What terrible thing wronged him in the past? It's a mystery. Yeah, just chuck that character's revenge motive into a mystery box with a little sticky note to remind the writer to flesh it out later. Then just drop the entire revenge plot at the story's midway point and never mention it again. This works especially well with characters who are introduced as being obsessed with revenge. 
Did they learn a lesson on how to appreciate what they have rather than dwelling on what they've lost? Nope, the writer just got bored with that character and turned them into yet another of the protagonist bench-warming cheerleaders. The party's anti-hero is so obsessed with his revenge that he instantly joins the hero's party in spite of their completely divergent goals and then just puts up with all this endless side questing. Actually, pursuing revenge is a privilege reserved only for the protagonist. Nothing can stop our avenging crusader as he chews his way through the lieutenants of the villain who wronged him. There is nothing but bloody destruction in his wake as he will stop at nothing to see his revenge complete. Soon he will meet the one who wronged him, and there is only one way this will end. In a love triangle, the love interest may have died in the prologue, but that won't stop the romance side plot from utterly stopping the revenge plot in its tracks. Did the audience sign on for a bloody revenge story? Well, too bad. Now it's a romantic comedy. There are, of course, other ways to end a revenge plot, but this does lead to a bit of a problem for those writing a more noble heroic Avenger. How can my hero get his revenge while also keeping the moral high ground? Uh... Oh no, says the convenient side character I'd forgotten about until just now. You can't kill Duke Drake and Direburn. If you do, you will be just like him. Oh no, says the hero in the first bout of self-awareness displayed in the whole story. Instead, the hero decides to spare the mass-murdering villain that almost no one would blame him for slaying on the spot. If he did, he would be just like the villain who murdered thousands of innocents unprovoked, burned down entire cities, laid waste to whole kingdoms, and nearly awakened the dark gods from beyond the void to end the universe. See? Completely morally equivalent. Murder one fantasy Hitler and you were just as bad. There, moral high ground achieved. Sparing the main villain totally keeps my hero in the right by allowing a key threat to the safety and security of the free world to persist. Of course, all those minions he mowed down earlier in his revenge quest don't count towards the hero's karma score, but this leads to an even worse problem. How can I vicariously indulge in my own revenge fantasy if I can't have my blatant self-insert murder the villain? I got it. To everyone's surprise, somehow the dastardly villain takes the opportunity to strike at the hero one last time, no matter how much this makes no tactical or strategic sense. This allows my hero to kill the villain and finally be justified since it's self-defense. Yes, this is dumb even if the villain was previously described as cunning and would be better off biding his time with a lengthy trial, and yes, it makes the hero look like a chump, but I'm far too busy wallowing in my revenge power fantasy and perceived moral superiority to notice. If anyone complains that I'm indulging in my revenge fantasy a little too much, then just give them the old cycle of revenge story moral, and that'll shut them up. The cycle of revenge is when a character takes revenge, but their collateral damage causes someone to take revenge on them, only for their collateral damage to make someone else seek revenge on them, and so on and so on. Now, there is a number of things a writer can do to make sure this moral really sinks in for the audience. No, not using subtlety by showing the damage caused by seeking vengeance. The superior method is having a character soapbox about how revenge is no good bad and have the moral of the story be spelled out over and over again in the most blunt, stupid way possible until the audience is seeking revenge for having their time wasted by all this heavy-handed preaching. Also, try to remember that the best way to show that revenge is bad in a story is by having it solve literally every problem the protagonist faces, while making the protagonist look super cool as he mows down scores of his fellow human beings. And if all this isn't enough, then a writer can always just white whale the entire cast down with Ahab. That's right, just kill off all the characters. Having a character's quest for revenge culminate in the destruction of the entire cast can be an appropriate climax for a story centered upon a dark theme like Vendetta, especially when rooted in strong characterization. Alas, this bleak ending could all have been averted if only the protagonist could have seen past their revenge. And, you know, if any other character had half a freaking brain to put the brakes on this train to Vendetta Town. Good thing I lobotomized most of the other characters to remove their vital sense of self-preservation. Can't have something like basic pattern recognition or rudimentary situational awareness get in the way of my tragic ending. Now, I've gone over all the ways to take shortcuts on revenge plots for those who just want a cool revenge story without putting in all the effort to make it work. But what if a writer is really invested in their revenge? What if the revenge needs to be elaborate? Like, for example... Remember my dear revenge plot that day a long time ago, back when young JP was the star in a high school production of Hamlet? You remember, don't you, revenge plot? 
when you made me forget my lines, when I was laughed at by everyone. You don't remember my dear revenge plot. Well, I do. The stain of that performance was to follow me for years to come. My life was in tatters after that. But I persevered. I wrote a book and started an entire YouTube channel, gathering an audience many times over the one you used to humiliate me on that day. And with this video, at long last, I will bring ruin upon all revenge plots for all stories for all time. I will wade through a thousand plot holes and a thousand contrivances in order to realize my overly elaborate and completely illogical revenge that by all accounts shouldn't succeed because it has more moving parts than a space shuttle. Thus I give up the spear. Oh no, wait, it wasn't a production of Hamlet, it was a rendition of the Three Musketeers. Ugh, now I gotta start my revenge plot all over again. Fools, you are now at my mercy. None will escape and your deaths will be full of anguish. Um, you're locked in here with us too. Sorry, sorry, old habit. Usually I'm on the other side of the dungeon cells, gloating at the captured heroes. If only we had a tool designed for cutting. <coughs> Excuse me. The military-industrial complex always gives me indigestion. Ugh, that was disgusting. This is 67% optimum. Use your chainsaw hand to cut through our cage. This doesn't even work. Looks cool, though. Now excuse me, but I have to go take history's longest shower. Unfortunately, Mr. Metal Face, you are imprisoned within a dungeon like the rest of us. Oh no, they finally found out about those blue space cat people. Um, I mean, what war crimes? How was I supposed to know that stupid tree was sacred? Ha! 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 Excuse me again. Is that this video sponsor? Wait. Are those the heroes in their own skit? Ah, it seems as though they are on Nebula, a streaming platform made by creators to escape the nefarious algorithm that is actually Streamy Award nominated. Part of the TWA expanded universe is there, but those poor saps don't even get ads. Or to get a sponsor, we will have to enter a vicious world of petty backstabbing where self-interest rules all. A place so dangerous that you can't be certain who is friend or foe. So like beauty vloggers? Oh no, nothing that savage. Ha! Huh. Pathetic. With one stuck in jail, tin can. Curiosity Stream has partnered with Nebula to bring ad free experimental content like this short skit, companion piece to the Sponsorship Wars, that replaces this ad on Nebula. Is it called The Poverty Wars because I'm the one with all of the sponsors? This extra Nebula skit is thanks to Curiosity Stream. A subscription streaming service with thousands of documentaries and non-fiction titles. I personally like the Apocalypse documentaries on World War One and Two. Ah, just like the good old days of the History Channel. Or Out of the Cradle featuring the history of humanity's evolution with CGI from Square Enix. Curiosity Stream loves educational creators and have teamed up with them to give you Nebula for free if you sign up for Curiosity Stream using the link below or going to curiositystream.com slash TWA. For a limited time, get 26% off Curiosity Stream's annual subscription for less than $15 a year. That's $14.79 using the code TWA to get both Curiosity Stream and Nebula. You didn't mention the series Secrets of the Solar System. I like space documentaries. Also, I'll be taking that sponsor for myself now. 